Hey guys, it's Greg from BitGoblin again. So a while ago, I did a video on how to set up and install Unraid where I went through and showed you all the whole process of creating the initial bootable USB drive all the way to configuring the storage array and creating file shares. Go check it out if you're interested in that. But since Unraid is not for everyone, I figured it would only be fair to also do a similar tutorial on TrueNAS, formerly known as FreeNAS. It's another NAS operating system that is popular amongst home users and even small to medium sized businesses because it's free and open source, is really flexible for many use cases, and provides an easy to use front end for setting up and managing ZFS volumes. Personally, I've been using it on my NAS for, God, like going on like six years now since I built it way back in 2016. And yeah, let's just get started. You smell that? It smells like a bit goblin. So the first thing we need to do is download the TrueNAS installation image. And for that, I have Vivaldi open. In your browser's address bar, go to www.truenas.com. And when you get to this page, hover over the green Get TrueNAS button in the upper right corner and click on TrueNAS Core. On this page, we can skip the email sign up by clicking the No Thank You, I Have Already Signed Up link. Then click on Download Now on the right. Your download should now be started and it may take a hot minute. Once that's done, I'll meet you in the terminal. Now that we're in the terminal, make sure you have your flash drive plugged into your PC. And before we make it into a bootable drive, we need to first find out the path where our drive is located. For that, run sudo fdisk lowercase l and scroll through the output till you find the one that matches your flash drive. The last one here is for my drive since it's the only 16 gigabyte ish drive that's connected to my system and make a note of the disk path to the left. Mine here is slash dev slash sdg. Now we need to write the TrueNAS image to our drive, and the command for this is sudo ddbs equals four capital M. This is the block size that we're going to write our image with, and four megabytes is a good guess for this if you're not sure what to use here. Next is if equals the path to your TrueNAS image. This is the in file that we're going to be writing. And then after that, do OF or out file equals slash dev slash SDG. Be careful with the drive path since this will overwrite whatever drive you enter here. And I have personally wiped my PC a couple times by mistyping this. Just double check this just to be safe. Now hit enter and wait till it's done writing before removing it and then put it in your NAS. At this point, you just need to power on your NAS and boot into the flash drive. And eventually you should end up at a screen like this. Select the first option to install slash upgrade, since that's what we're doing today. And on the next screen, you'll need to select what drive to install TrueNAS on. Typically, I'd recommend going with an SSD here, since those are more reliable than a cheap USB drive, but I'm going to install it on my 32 gigabyte flash drive here for demonstration purposes. Next, you're prompted for a password, enter whatever you would like, and then select your boot mode. This screen explains it very well, Basically, you'll want BIOS mode if you have old or enterprise hardware that doesn't support UEFI. And if you do have hardware that has UEFI firmware, then you'll want to use that, which is what I'm going to use since my board has UEFI. Now it's going to run through a bunch of low level stuff. And once it's done, you can reboot your system. Once your system has rebooted, you'll be met with a text based console like this that you see on the screen right now. Towards the bottom here, the console thoughtfully gives you the IP address that you can manage your system with. Enter this in your web browser and I will meet you over there. If all has gone well, you'll be at this login screen for TrueNAS. For the username, enter root. For the password, enter whatever you set a moment ago. Hit enter and you'll be presented with a slick looking dashboard with your info about your NAS. Before we go and set up the file system, shares and all that stuff, let's take care of some housekeeping. First, let's go and check for any updates as you should do on pretty much any freshly installed system. On the left, go under System, Update, and then click on the Check for Updates button. Thankfully, there aren't any new updates, so we can just move on. So to get our NAS actually functioning like, well, a NAS, we need to configure our storage and set up a file share. To take care of the storage, we need to go to the Storage tab, then Pools. Now let's just sit back and talk for a sec about how ZFS storage is put together. There are three main things to know about, VDEVs, pools, and datasets. Simply speaking, VDEVs are building blocks that are comprised of one or more disks and handles the redundancy via either mirroring or parity. Pools are comprised of one or more VDEVs and stripes data across them. And I'll note here, this is how you get to rate arrays like one plus zero or six plus zero, where you stripe data across multiple lower level rate arrays. 
and data sets are like partitions of your pool that you'll use to control your data with quotas, permissions, and such. Now that was a very simplistic description of how ZFS works. There's really a lot more to it and I'd highly suggest you read up on it if you have the time for it. But for now, what we need to do is click add pool in the upper right corner. Make sure the create new pool box is ticked. Click create pool again and you'll be met with this screen. In the top left, give your pool a name. I'll just name it vault. Check the box to the right if you want encryption. Under the available disks column, tick the box for the disk that you want to add to your array. In my case, I'm just selecting my two terabyte hard drive, but you'll likely want to select multiple disks here. Then click the right arrow and those disks will now show under the data VDEVs column. Here, we would normally select the VDEV layout underneath this data VDEVs column, and usually you'd want at least like a mirror, if not RAID Z1, 2, or 3 for some redundancy in the event of a hard drive failure. A simple stripe here, as is noted down here, is not safe nor recommended because there's no protection in case that drive dies. But again, I'm just demoing this on my test bench and only have one drive to use. Thus, we need to check this force box because I'm doing an unsafe thing. Click create, check the confirm box in the pop-up dialog box, and then click create pool. And boom, roasted, the pool is ready. Now we need to create a ZFS dataset. This is pretty easy. Just click the hamburger menu icon for our new pool and add dataset. Here we have a bunch of options that we can fiddle with, but we really only need to give it a name for our goal of a functioning file server. So I'll just give it the name my data and click create. If we go back really quick to edit the dataset options, we can change things like enabling ZFS deduplication, modify the record size and set a quota for the dataset. But again, we're not gonna go through all of this now. These are just things that you may want to take a look at later. Finally, we just need to set up the file share. Under the sharing tab, we have a few different options for an NFS or Unix file share, Windows or SMB file share, or even things like iSCSI block shares and Apple file shares. These have different use cases, but most likely you'll just want to use the Windows file share. So go ahead and click Windows file share and then click add in the upper right corner. First, we need to select our local storage path to our dataset. So let's hit the drop down arrow and then hit the drop down arrow again and then select my data. For the share name, I'll just keep it simple and call it my data. We don't need to tweak the other options, so click submit, enable service so that the Samba server starts automatically, then configure permissions. You can get fancy with your permissions if you want, but I'm just gonna go the easy route for now with the open preset. I'd highly recommend not doing this for production use, but for now, this is good enough. Now, one more thing we need to do to access the share is create a user on the NAS to log in with. So head over to the accounts tab on the left, users, add, and then fill out your user info. I'm going to give it the username bitgoblin, set a password, and we should be good to go. Now that our user is created, let's test the share out. So on my Windows PC, I just have File Explorer opened and in the address bar, enter backslash backslash the IP address of your server. In this case, it's 10.7.20.138 for me, then backslash and then my data. You'll get a Windows authentication prompt for the share and then enter your credentials. And voila, you've logged into your share and you can now create files and folders and do whatever you want with it. Now, before we sign off here, let's do some more like housekeeping type stuff and configure our NAS a little bit more to get a solid baseline. First, let's configure our network settings. So under the network tab, go to global configuration. Here we can set things like our system host name, which I will set to my NAS and then domain name, which I'll use my domain. You can set static DNS servers if you want, but I'll leave that alone for now. Next, let's look at our network adapters. So back under the network tab, click on interfaces, click the right arrow for the primary interface, and then click on edit. Here we can set our machine to use DHCP or static addressing. DHCP is plug and play and it's what I use on my network. But if you want a static addressing, you just need to uncheck this box, go down to the bottom and then add a static address. Again, I'm not gonna do that now since DHCP is what I use, but you may want to do that depending on how you set up your network. All right, now let's take a look at securing the web interface. Go to system, general, and in the middle of the page, check the web interface HTTP to HTTPS redirect. This basically just forces you to use an HTTPS connection when managing your NAS. And it's really just a small thing that really only matters if someone nefarious is on your network sniffing traffic, but it just gives me peace of mind enabling the redirect. Click save and then restart the web service when prompted. Finally, let's take a look at setting up email settings so our NAS will send us notifications for things like 
when your pool is filling up, it detects a bad drive or something of the sort. So go to system, then mail, and you can fill out your mail server info here. The from email and names parameters are who your emails are marked as being sent from. You can set what you want here. You could do something like truenas at mydomain.com or whatever, totally up to you. Now, the next option is the send mail method, and that depends on how you want to route your email. The easiest option would be to select the Gmail OAuth option and then go through the login to Gmail button to set up your NAS to send through Google's mail servers. But since I have a local mail relay sending through Mailgun, I'm going to use the SMTP method and give it my server host name. I'm not gonna give real info here, obviously, but if you got everything set up correctly, you can then send a test email to the email address on the root user account. I haven't set this up yet, so let's go to accounts, then users, drop down on the root user and then click edit. Enter your email address, click save, and now you should have email notifications going to your email address for certain events on your NAS. All right, that does it for the tutorial. And by this point, you should now have a working network file share backed by hopefully redundant storage, assuming you did better than me and used more than one disk. While I went over a few management type things to get you started, like updating the system, configuring networking, and setting up email notifications, there is still a ton more that you can configure your system with. Things like tightening down security on your shares so only specific users can modify them instead of just being open like we set up, uh, scheduling periodic smart checks on your disks, encrypting your ZFS pools, using VMs and jails, which are FreeBSD's equivalent technology to containers, uh, to host apps on your NAS, just to name a few. And there's tons of other stuff that you can do as well in the name of fine tuning the performance of your NAS, including uh, changing like the block size of your ZFS pools. Now you might be thinking, why should I use TrueNAS over Unraid? Don't they both do basically the same thing? And while I'm going to save most of that topic for another video talking about the differences between the two, I'll just give you a couple thoughts for in favor of FreeNAS. <laughs> uh, I slipped and said FreeNAS. I'm just so used to it. But anyways, a couple reasons to use TrueNAS over Unraid are cost and performance. TrueNAS is free as in beer, meaning it doesn't cost anything, whereas Unraid does have a, albeit small cost, to use it long term. And TrueNAS can be more performant since it uses ZFS to stripe reads and writes across multiple drives, giving you more than just a single drive's performance. Whereas Unraid uses separate file systems per drive, and you usually only get about a single drive's worth of speed when manipulating files on the array. But I'll elaborate more on that topic in the future, and that's gonna do it for this video. If you disliked the video, then you know what to do, but if you did like it, then go hit that like button and also get subscribed and hit the bell icon so you can keep up with my latest videos and show your support. Also, feel free to leave a comment down below in the comment section with your thoughts on the video, if I did or explained something wrong, which always happens, or with your tips on how to get the most out of TrueNAS. I've also got a Discord server if you'd like to join the community and just chat and hang out with us, or if you need it, there are several channels to get help. I hope you all have a great day, and I will catch you in the next one.